everybody's here. So um, this is our expert today, our DNA expert, Dr. Nina Bernstein. Um, and she's going to be uh, telling us a bit more about DNA and answering all your questions. Um, and we also have our camps watching the live stream across Ontario. We have nine other camps watching and they're submitting their questions on Twitter and there's already quite a few coming in. So uh, this will be a good discussion about DNA today, um, which is awesome. All right, so um, one of the activities that the camps are doing is they're learning how to extract DNA from fruit. Mm. Um, have, has anyone done that yet this morning or is that this afternoon? This afternoon. Okay, okay. cool. So you'll ask all your questions first, <laughs> that's great. All right, so to start our discussion, Dr. Bernstein, can you tell us a bit more about DNA and uh, the types of things that you do at McEwen University? Well, DNA is one of the most important molecules that you have in just about every one of your cells. And uh, the, the purpose of DNA is I'm not sure if you've heard this phrase, but to act as a genetic blueprint or a set of information from which your whole body is built. And it tells us, you know, how to build your body, how to maintain it, how long each cell is going to live and so on. Um, so we have quite a lot of DNA in every one of our cells. We have uh, about three billion base pairs of DNA, which I don't know if you guys learned about that, but those are little building blocks of DNA. And uh, it's actually, it's a tiny molecule. I mean, all molecules are very small. We can't see it with our naked eye. But if you were to take the DNA from one cell and stretch it out, does anybody know how long the DNA would be? No idea? Yeah? I see an arm going up. It would be about 200 kilometers, I think, or from Well, I think that that would be if you take the, the DNA from your whole body, that that would be about right. But just from one cell, it would still be pretty long. It would be about two meters. And does anybody know how much two meters is? It's probably about twice your height. <laughs> so that's a lot of DNA. We have that in pretty much every one of our cells in the body. Uh, and um, so it's a very long molecule, but it's also very, very thin. And um, it, that's why you're able to pack it into the cells, right? It, it's folded up very compactly, very tightly, so it fits into every cell because cells are really small too. Now, when you guys do your extraction of DNA from fruit, you will see it. It will, it will well, maybe I shouldn't give it away. <laughs> You'll see what you observe today, but. Uh, you'll be able to see it because it's all going to be kind of like that string of DNA. It's all going to be kind of tangled up and you'll be able to pull it out with a stick. And uh, yeah, so that's the thing, but oh, we lost Ingersoll. Um, yeah, I think they'll, they'll hopefully call back. I think it might have been an okay. internet uh, issue. <laughs> um, but there are lots of very, very important things that we can do with DNA. And it has to do with, you know, they're applied in medicine, in agriculture, in, you know, in, in justice, like forensic solving crimes and so on. So learning about DNA is very important. So it's really great that you guys are doing it today. And some of the techniques you'll be using to extract DNA from fruit are some of the simple techniques that, you know, the scientists use to... Um, to solve crimes and to, you know, do genetic engineering and so on. So yeah, it's a good start. Uh, and yeah. okay, so what am I doing at McEwen University? Uh, so I, and some of my research involves working on what's called DNA repair. And so we already discussed that DNA is very, very crucial, very important in your body. So it's important to safe. Hi, everybody. <laughs> it's important to keep our DNA safe and not to have any mistakes. Because if you have a mistake in your DNA, that can lead to a mutation and change in your body and so on. So that could be a big problem. Now, it turns out that our DNA um, 
is often being attacked, well, all the time, is being attacked by various forces like uh, radiation, like, you know, UV light, that's why you have to wear a sunscreen or cover up when you go into the sun, uh, various chemicals, even, even chemicals that we produce in our bodies as part of our normal things that we do in life. Like when we breathe, we use oxygen, we produce these uh, molecules called free radicals, which damage our DNA. So our DNA can be broken, it can be changed, and it needs to be protected, it needs to be repaired. So we have these systems called DNA repair, and I'm studying one part of it, one part of these systems, one protein involved in DNA repair. Uh, so I've been working with some of our McEwen students to, to you know, learn more about this protein, how it works, precisely. Um, yeah, so that's one of my projects. Uh, some of the other things that are going on in, in my uh, department, for example, one of my colleagues is using DNA, uh, and he's using DNA sequences. So that's the, I guess you guys have learned maybe, that DNA is made up of these four letters, A, T, C, and G, and they occur in a specific sequence. That's what holds the information of the DNA. So he's using DNA sequences to study orchids. He's studying, he's trying to classify which orchid um, is, belongs to which, um, which species or which, uh, I guess, exact uh, type. And the reason it's important is because, I don't know if you guys are familiar with orchids, but when they flower, the flowers are very distinctive. Each type of orchid has a unique type of flower, but most of their lifetime, they don't flower. So if you're just looking at the green leaves, you don't know which kind of orchid you have. And that could be, uh, you know, people might be interested in orchids because, well, they're just beautiful flowers and they want to know which orchids, you know, they could buy or get. But they're also endangered species of orchids. And uh, if you see an orchid and you don't know what kind it is, it might be an endangered species, so it's important to test it. So, for example, um, our border patrol people, you know, when somebody is bringing in a plant, an orchid, they don't know if it's an endangered species, they can't tell if there's no flower, but they should be able to tell using this technology, right? They can, they can test the DNA and find out what kind of orchid it is. Okay, so that's just some of the work that's happening at McEwen University. Oh, very cool. Thank you for telling us about your research. Let's get to some questions from the campers. Can we start in Tilsenberg with a question for Dr. Bernstein? Does everything Hi. have DNA? Three? Does everything have DNA? Uh, so all the, yes, all living things have DNA. So all cells have DNA. Now, there's one exception, sort of an exception, that's viruses. Um, and viruses are <laughs> very, very complicated things. Uh, we, we don't even say, we can't even classify them exactly as living things. They're actually these, these parasites that infect living cells, and that's the only way they can live is if they infect a cell. And viruses carry their own um, information, right, their own genetic blueprint, but that could be DNA or RNA. Okay? But cells, all the cells have DNA. Okay? So all living things like you, me, every plant, every animal has DNA. Good question. Um, let's go to Ingersoll. Does someone have a question in Ingersoll there? Right here. If you had enough Hi. DNA, if you had enough DNA, could you make a like a person? <laughs> uh, so you're talking about human cloning. If you had enough DNA, could you make a person? Uh, I think right now we're not there yet. Uh, I guess, but. Potentially, that could be possible. Um, you'd have to have all their DNA without any breaks, without any mistakes. Um, then, I mean, there are more, you know, it's not just the DNA. The DNA contains the information, but how that information is read involves other molecules. So I think it's, it will be possible sometime in the future, but not yet. 
All right, good question there as well. So I'm looking at the questions on Twitter and quite a few of our camps want to know, how does DNA work? Oh, how does it work? That's a great question. Well, remember that I said DNA consists of these four building blocks. We call them four letters. They're really molecules, but we, we summarize their names by the first letters, A, T, C, and G. And just like letters in, you know, in a word, the sequence of those letters is what determines the meaning of the word, right? So the sequence of those letters in DNA determines the meaning, that information that's stored in the DNA. Okay, so uh, it has a specific sequence, A, T, C, G, G, T, C, A, whatever, like it just goes on like that. And that information is then read uh, and converted to amino acid sequence. Amino acids are building blocks of proteins. So there are actually 20 amino acids from which our proteins are made. And that's another important molecule that you know, our bodies are made of. Uh, for example, our muscles, uh, our bones, everything contains proteins. Our hair is a protein. Our skin is covered by protein. So they're everywhere. Right? So uh, DNA, that sequence of the four letters in DNA, is read and what's called eventually translated converted to information of the protein sequence. Um, now, it doesn't happen directly from DNA to protein. First, DNA uh, is read and converted to another molecule that's similar to DNA. It's called RNA. And then the RNA is read um, in three letters. And each three letters of that RNA sequence correspond to one amino acid. So that way, our four um, original DNA letters can code for many more amino acids, we have 20 amino acids. Uh, so basically it's all to do with the sequence and how it's read. Okay, so I, I don't know if that's enough of an answer for now. So the sequence of those letters would determine what, like the color of our hair and our eyes and things like that? Yeah, essentially, it yeah. Determines yeah, so who like, we are. So yeah, those are the genes, right? The sequence of the letters determines what's in that gene. So the gene is the piece of DNA that has a specific meaning. And then when that gene is eventually converted to a protein, like I said, through an RNA step, um, the protein eventually will, will ultimately determine, you know, the final product. Okay. Okay. Um, so if, DNA is everywhere within us, I guess. Brantford wants to know, if you touched a tennis ball, would your DNA be on it? Hmm, good question. Um, so I'm not an expert in forensics, which is the study of, you know, how, how when you solve crimes and everything using DNA, among other things. There is this concept of touch DNA. So when you, when you touch any object, you leave a tiny bit of your cells. So your, your skin has cells, right? And we're always shedding them, tiny little amounts of cells. These are dead cells, but they might still have some DNA there. And you might deposit a molecule or two of DNA. Now, that's not really very much, but we do have techniques, um, and one specifically very important technique called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, which helps to amplify DNA. So even if you start with, let's say, one or two or three molecules of DNA, you could potentially multiply those molecules. So that's how, that's the idea of this touch DNA. Even if there's a tiny bit of DNA, it may be detectable. Um, so yeah, you probably would leave, when you touch a tennis ball, you probably leave a tiny, tiny bit of DNA. So itself directly, nobody would know. But if you, you know, do some special things to it, then yeah, you could potentially find it. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so another question here on Twitter from our camp in Clinton. Um, they want to know how does DNA form RNA? Okay, so that's a great question. Uh, so DNA is, uh, is our permanent kind of information storage molecule. And, you know, as I already mentioned, it has to be kept very safe and and, and so on, right? We keep it in ourselves, we protect it, we have ways to, uh, to uh, repair it if it gets damaged. Now, 
RNA is a disposable message, like a, a disposable version of DNA, you might say, a temporary version of DNA. And it looks a lot like DNA. It's also made up of four letters. We'll call them letters, four building blocks. Uh, they're not ATCNG, they're called AUCNG. U is similar to T, it has a small chemical difference, um, but that's the same way. And the, that sequence of RNA could, is the same as the sequence of DNA, except where in DNA there's a U, in RNA, in T, in RNA there's a U. And what happens is um, how you make RNA from DNA is DNA contains two strands, like two strings running side by side. And what's really important is that those, uh, the way the strings are held together is by what's called base pairing. So those four building blocks, those four letters, interact with each other in a very specific way. So if you have an A on one string of DNA, or one strand as we call it, it will only form a pair with a T on the other side. And if you have a T, it'll form a pair with an A. If you have a G, it'll go with a C. If you have a C, it'll form a base pair with a G. So that means when we have the sequence of our first strand, let's say A, T, C, and G, then we know precisely the sequence of the opposite strand. So where there's an A in one, there'll be a T in the opposite. There's a C in one, there'll be a G in the opposite, and so on. Now, RNA contains four letters as well, so that A in DNA will pair with a U in RNA, a T in DNA will base pair with an A in RNA, a G in DNA will base pair with a C in RNA, and a C with a G, right? So when these special enzymes read the DNA sequence, they'll make what's called a complementary RNA sequence. They'll read the DNA, and they'll form an RNA that has that, that sequence that will match the DNA, okay? So that's how okay. that's how we're related. Um, so talking about DNA and RNA, um, there's a question from our camp in New Hamburg. Are there different types of DNA? Sorry, <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, are there different types of DNA? Yeah. Is that the question? That, that's the question. Uh, well, I guess it depends on which level we look at DNA. So chemically, on the chemical level, all DNA is the same. So it will all have those four bases, A, T, C, and G. It will be base paired, so A with T, G with C. Um, they're all connected by the same chemical bonds. So in that sense, it's the same. Um, what makes it different, I guess you could say, is kind of on a larger level. For example, how the DNA is packaged. So remember we said at the very beginning, we have a lot of DNA in our cells, right? Each one of our cells contains two meters of DNA, that's a lot of DNA, right? And we have to package it up, you have to kind of twist it up to fit into the tiny little cell. Now, it's not just randomly twisted, it's twisted in a very specific way so that it doesn't get tangled. <laughs> um, so uh, cells like, like our cells, or, or let's say more generally eukaryotic cells, I don't know if you're familiar with those, they're kind of more complicated cells, they have a nucleus, anyway. Um, have their DNA packaged in one way, in, in uh, a structure called chromatin, where the DNA is wound up uh, like beads on a string and then compacted very, very tightly. Uh, and then there are other cells, like bacterial cells, they're much simpler, uh, and they have less DNA to compact. It's still quite a bit, but it's less, and it's compacted in a different way than ours. So in that sense, the DNA looks different, but keep, keep in mind, chemically, it's still exactly the same molecule. All right. Okay. Um, let's go back to um, Tilsenberg. Is there a question in Tilsenberg? All right. Why can things have two heads? <laughs> Sorry. Can you why, hear that? Why can things have two heads? Two hands. Uh, two heads. Oh. He two yeah, his question is, why can things have two heads? Two heads, right? like, yeah. you mean like uh, conjoined like twins? Like maybe a mutation is or something? Is that what you mean? Like, yeah. Oh, I think, yeah, you're probably referring to mutations, right? So, like, sometimes 
um, animals, let's say, could, when you mess up their DNA, and you know it could be done in the lab. I, I don't personally work on that, but it, it, it can be done. Uh, let's say you expose um, the, the animal, let's say even a fruit fly or something, to some of those DNA damaging uh, agents. So let's say you, you zap it with uh, ultraviolet light or some something else like that. It will cause mutations in their DNA, and then things will grow where they're not supposed to grow. Like for example, they'll have legs coming out, you know, of their antenna and so on. And that's because you messed up their DNA, so it's caused the mutation. All right, I saw a hand up in Ingersoll. Is there a question there? Hi. <laughs> oh, um, just speak up a little bit louder. I couldn't hear you. Can you transfer a DNA to another person? Can you transfer DNA to another person? Wow, that's that's really advanced. Uh, uh, yes, <laughs> you can. It's not uh, it, it's not simple. Um, and um, I think the application for that is called gene therapy. So genes are those, those pieces of DNA, that information within our DNA that, that has, you know, holds specific meanings. So, for example, that one piece of DNA that tells us how to make a specific protein, right? So what happens is, uh, when people have a genetic disease, like there's something wrong with one of their genes, you want to fix that gene, right? So that's that that can be done by genetic engineering, and it's not simple. There, uh, it's a very difficult way to, or thing to do. But there are new technologies being developed. They're making it more and more likely to do. And uh, so what you want to do, let's say, is maybe cut out that piece of DNA and add a new piece of DNA. Okay, so that way you are transferring uh, foreign DNA or external DNA to somebody's cells. Okay. okay. Um, I'm going to go to Twitter for our last question today. Um, our camp in Dundas, they want to know how many genes do we have and how many do we know about? Ooh. That's a really good question, uh, and I'm not sure I can give you an exact answer because I think we don't exactly know how many genes a human being has. Uh, before the human genome was solved, the, the, the whole sequence of the human genome was, was, was found out, the thinking was we have many, many genes because we're so complex, but once the human genome sequence was determined, was figured out completely, we saw that we don't have so many genes. We have, I believe now, the estimate is about 25,000 genes. And it's actually wow. not, not that much more than something like uh, a worm, C. elegans, like a little tiny microscopic worm. Now, there are ways to increase the number of proteins that we can make from our limited number of genes. And that gets pretty complicated, um, but... Yeah, we don't have that many genes in our DNA. <laughs> All right, but 25,000, that's, that's more than I would have ever thought. <laughs> that's quite a lot. That's quite a bit, but um, if you think so, uh, corn has more than we do. <laughs> corn, uh, the plant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of crazy, yeah. yeah. Um, so I know I said that was our last question, but I just wanted to check with any of our live camps. Is there another one? From either, okay, I see a hand up in Tilsonburg. Let's go there first. Okay. How does DNA, like, work? Like, what is DNA? How does DNA work? Well, so, yeah, we already, you know, as we mentioned already, it's, uh, it's this, you can consider it like a, a string with beads on it, and there are only four different colors of beads those four building blocks and uh, that, that sequence of the beads is what determines the, the meaning of the DNA, right? That information that's in the DNA. Um, and eventually that information from DNA 
will be converted to RNA. That's another information molecule that's, like, as we said, our disposable message. So it will be used up. It will be read to make proteins. And then it will be you know, broken up into pieces. And DNA okay. is stored forever, and RNA is just stored for a little bit, and then that's it. All right, and uh, Ingersoll, I see a camper there. Hi. Hi, um, I was wondering what's the Human gene Genome Project? You're wondering about it? Yes. So, uh, uh, so it was, uh, I believe, 1990. Mm. I can't remember what year it was actually, but um, uh, it, when it started out, I mean, it was a huge, huge undertaking. The Human Genome Project, for those of you who don't know, was the this um, uh, project to figure out that sequence of those four letters of the whole DNA in humans, that two meters long DNA that we talked about, to figure out every letter, the sequence of every letter, and. Uh, Technically, that was a very difficult task because the way we used to figure out the sequence of DNA, it would take, I don't know, probably 100 years to do a human genome uh, and a lot of money, a lot of people working and so on. Uh, but, you know, innovation has been amazing in this field in DNA sequencing. And uh, the, the Human Genome Project was finished before it was originally planned. Uh, there were many, many scientists participating it, in it around the world. There was a kind of a government, a public effort, and there's also a private company. Uh, and eventually they did it. They saw the sequence of the human genome. But now, you know, we're all different, right? Every person is unique. So that human genome that they solved originally belonged to one person. So it's not like we knew the gene, the gene sequence of every single person all at once, right? Now... Can we find out the sequence of your genome or my genome? Well, it's getting to that stage now with the technology advancements that we can, and it can take less than a week now. Um, there are DNA sequencing instruments that will do what's called next generation sequencing, next generation sequencing. And it's using a very different technology from what was used originally, but it's able to sequence so much more DNA, so much faster that now it's becoming possible to get anyone's genome sequence in much more, much, much shorter time and much lower cost than before. Right. So wow, I hope that answers good question. Thanks. Um, so that's all the time we have today with Dr. Bernstein. Thank you so much, Dr. Bernstein, for telling My us pleasure. more about DNA. And Great question. All... Yeah, those were really good questions. And, uh, it's a very interesting topic as well. So thank you um, to all our campers in Tilsonburg and Ingersoll. Thanks, everyone. And thanks Bye. to everyone who submitted questions on Twitter. Bye. Thank you.